Hello, everybody. My name is Martin Vidartondo, and I want to thank you for joining in on this fungus day. So my main interest in fungi is that they are so remarkably interactive. And uh, one of their main interactions uh, is with plants. And that's what I want to discuss in more detail today. So I've divided this presentation into four parts. And we're going to start with interactions and how we define them and how biologists talk about interactions between species. Then we're going to talk about the greening of the earth, the conquest of land. Then we're going to talk about how sometimes there is some cheating going on in these interactions. And we're going to finish talking about how fungi and plants are coping with environmental change in forests. So a bit of history about how we talk about interactions. So um, the most commonly studied type of interaction is competition to this day. And uh, the original definition of competition um, has some perhaps more positive uh, implications that you would expect. Uh, it has to do with meeting or coming together with uh, agreeing or coinciding on something. And um, there's a bit of a change. So in the Middle Ages, uh, there's an additional uh, meaning that is striving for the same limited resource. And this could be the hand of a maiden or it could be um, land. And uh, this is the meaning uh, generally associated with competition. And uh, this is something that is very central to how uh, people that work in ecology and evolution have been thinking. However, um, in the 1870s, uh, there is some change and some biologists start talking about things like symbiosis. So completely new term created to describe the closeness, the intimacy in how um, some fungi and some plants can coexist. So um, people like Devari and, Fra and Frank were working on things like lichens, so a fungus and lots of um, cells of um, algae, mycorrhizas, so you have a, a, a root that is completely covered by fungus, or uh, interactions in which fungi are growing in between the cells of plants and they are poking into the cells and they are taking resources from them. Uh, the 1870s uh, was a, a time of change. There was a lot of turmoil in society. And uh, this is the time when, for instance, Karl Marx is publishing uh, books about capitalism. And uh, the Industrial Revolution has been going on for a while. And uh, there is a lot of uh, rather appalling conditions in which people are living in um, industrialized societies by that time. There is also uh, some discussion among biologists of uh, the term mutualism. And this is something that again emerges in the 1870s. Is this is from Van Beneden, uh, who worked on marine um, uh, organisms. And he is talking about unlike organisms helping each other out. Uh, if we move further in time uh, into the 1950s, uh, we start to get discussions about cooperation. And these are uh, interactions that are beneficial, but they are not obligate. So this is something that organisms opt in or out of. Um, and uh, closer to now, we have uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Ragan Calloway talking about uh, facilitation. And this is the idea of uh, one uh, organism helping an, another one, but not really getting uh, anything in, in return. There's been uh, very many uh, scientific books published on uh, the concepts of uh, mutualism and symbiosis, and this is a discussion that very much goes on to this day. So I'm going to be focusing on plant fungal interactions, um, and we will see how some of these terms come into play. So I'm going to start at the beginning. So this is going to be the conquest of land, the greening of the earth. And 
If we go back uh, into the Cambrian, there is a great explosion in diversity of animals. And there are some very large, uh, complex animals that evolved in the water. However, the land remains quite barren. And it is not a, until about 70 million years later that we start to find ecosystems, habitats that look uh, uh, greened. So there is a sort of a carpet starting to form of uh, green plants. If we move further in time to the present, we have essentially two major types of, of systems. So we have um, places like the Scottish Highlands, where we have uh, very small plants that are dominant, uh, things like liverworts, hornworts, mosses, that are uh, very restricted to areas where there is a lot of water. And we also have pretty much the rest of the land, which is uh, covered by mainly flowering plants, sometimes conifers. Uh, these are more recently evolved groups of plants and uh, they cover the land completely. And um, about 10,000, 12,000 years ago, we started domesticating uh, a few of these flowering plants and we create ecosystems for them. So these are um, agricultural uh, systems like the one shown here. So this we refer to as non-vascular plants and these are vascular plants, okay? So these have uh, a lack of uh, conducting tissues to move resources within the plant. These have those xylem and phloem, for instance. Fungi have been very integral in this process. Uh, and although you cannot see them in these pictures, they are there. So we're going to talk about uh, how they uh, play their roles, how they interact with these plants. So if we think about ancient plants, there are some lineages that are still alive with us today. So um, we have plants like liverworts here or hornworts. And uh, if you make a, a section through one of these plants and you look in them uh, or you look in a book, then you can see this. So you have uh, a layer up here that is green where photosynthesis happens. Then this layer that seems to just have cells that uh, are uh, supporting the rest. And then in here we have um, a bottom layer where there are some hairs that are growing into the uh, substrate uh, and they are taking up water, they are taking up uh, minerals. However, when you look at these uh, plants in nature, they're actually uh, much more interesting than that. So if you look at the cells here, it turns out that they are actually filled with fungi. It is quite exceptional, really. Um, we have lots and lots of these branch structures like this, or lots of coiled uh, structures like this. So lots of filaments, lots of fungi growing within living cells of these plants. So now this is today. If we go back in time, there are a very few superbly preserved fossils of early land plants. And uh, if we look in them, uh, these are from the Rhiney Chert in, in Scotland, they have uh, individual plant cells. There's one here, another one here. And if you look inside of those cells, you see these structures that look highly branched. It looks like maybe there's a filament here crossing between cells and making another branch structure in here. Now there's another branch structure in here. And this look uh, very much like these kinds of um, structures or perhaps like these. So about 410 million years ago, we already have some evidence that there would have been this very intimate interactions between living plants and fungi. In 2011, we um, published this paper. We had been doing a study trying to figure out which fungi this were. Uh, there had been some controversy about uh, what types of fungi were doing this with plants. Um, and we, we sorted this out. Uh, it, this, the big surprise uh, was that there was this group of fungi that we'd not expect to find inside of plants. Uh, so that was quite interesting. There was another group of uh, fungi that we did expect to find and we did find them. Since then, we have been looking in more depth at what is going on about the ecology and the evolution of these um, plant fungal interactions. And we've learned quite a lot and we've published uh, quite a lot of papers on this topic. And it is something that, that goes on. We are still very much learning. If we want to look at 
um, the evolution of plants. So these are these lines here, uh, these green lineages, and um, we are going back in time to about 500 million years ago. The idea is that very, very early on, uh, as soon as plants come out of land, they start to engage in symbiosis with fungi. And notice that this really is very early. This is before plants have stomata uh, for, for breathing, before they have roots, um, before they have seeds, before they have flowers, or before they have fruits. Um, and so this uh, is something quite uh, uh, interesting. And um, if we look at what we know about fossil plants, the fossils uh, are, they do not go back as far as this point in uh, history. However, we do start getting uh, fossils like the ones from the Rhiney chart about here. So that's about the time that plants are starting to evolve roots. If we look at uh, what kinds of plants are alive today, so we have the green algae growing in, in aquatic systems that don't need fungi, resources float to them through the water, and then we make that big jump very difficult into dry land, and uh, we start to uh, evolve various groups of plants. And there is quite a lot of fungi that are participating in that, allowing that uh, diversification of, of um, plants from the start. However, if we look at um, later groups of plants, or so more recently evolved, then we start dealing with these structures called roots. So what's going on with these, um, with these plants? So the, the problem here is how do you deal with soil? And this is what we need to resolve. So soil is extremely complex, very challenging environment. Uh, there are lots of pores and cracks and crevices where nutrients and water are, are hidden away. And what plants can do is that they can, in the surface of the roots, they can have cells that grow little hairs, okay? And these are called root hairs. They tend to be quite short, so less than a centimeter. They tend to be quite thick and stubby, and they're formed by a single cell. In contrast, fungi can be much more um, efficient in the way in which they can explore soil, in which they can mine and scavenge for scarce resources. So um, the fungi are uh, able to produce filaments, threads that are very, very long, uh, many meters even. They can be very thin, so it's about 10 times thinner than the root hairs. They are composed of many cells, so they have many more possibilities. For instance, they can branch and they can also network, so they can fuse with each other and make complex networks. Fungi are also very good at releasing lots of enzymes into the environment to break down complicated molecules and bring in simpler ones into their cells. So, you could compete uh, plants with fungi, or you could cooperate. So, this is just what happens. So this engage in symbiosis. There is a mutualistic interaction going on here, and we have uh, the more normal look of roots, which would be something like this, with lots and lots of filaments that look like spaghetti here, growing all over the surface here, around this, this root, uh, in the soil, and in and out of the cells of this plant. If we zoom into individual cells here, you might see something like this. So very highly branched um, structure. So lots and lots of filaments, lots of surface area to exchange resources uh, between the fungus and the plant. And this is very, very common. Um, here there's a shrub, there is uh, roots, and there are all these uh, filaments with their big spores um, growing in and out of these roots. Another look is this. So you can have the whole root be completely covered with filaments. Um, so the, the epidermis of this root is, is gone. There aren't going to be any root hairs left there. And then the fungus is going to take on the role of taking up all the resources from the uh, soil and passing them onto the plant. Um, and here you have a really young birch seedling. It has just one leaf. Um, the first leaf here, these are the cotyledons. And here you've got a, a root that still has root hairs, another root that still has root hairs, and these older roots have been transformed by the fungus uh, into structures that look like this. Okay, um, here you have a conifer, roots, 
um, these uh, fungi growing on those roots and then the fungi making uh, threads into the soil and then sometimes producing maybe mushrooms. So we can say that most plants don't have roots, they have fungi roots or mycorrhizas. And uh, there are sort of two main flavors here, these endo or internal ones and these ecto or external ones. So we come back to our um, tree of um, plants and we can see um, that we still have our uh, uh, fossil information here and now we've put in here information about the fungi that are uh, on the roots of um, some of the more recent groups of plants. And then we put in here all the different groups of fungi and which ones are present on which plants. And as you can see, there's a lot of fungi all over this tree. Uh, and that is uh, that does make sense again uh, in relation to the idea that uh, symbiosis with fungi was really uh, instrumental in allowing plants to um, colonize the land. You might notice uh, there is an exception always in biology, uh, and that is the mosses. The mosses do things differently. Uh, they have uh, hairs that actually can branch and can become just as thin as the filaments of fungi. So, uh, we've, we've published uh, papers about uh, this idea. We even got the cover of some uh, scientific journals. And um, this is a reason to celebrate. Um, this uh, partnership being successful led to the greening of the land, the formation of soils. Uh, it decarbonized the air. It added oxygen to the air. It um, di allowed species of fungi to diversify. Uh, species of plants to uh, increase and also uh, animals to start colonizing land. So hooray. Now let's talk about uh, things going in a different direction. So now we're going to cheat the system. So here we have uh, a green plant and it's got uh, various uh, fungi that it's forming a symbiosis with um, at the same time. And uh, there are these double-ended arrows here. So there are resources going from the plant. These are typically sugars or fats going into the fungus. And from the fungus, there are resources going into the plant. So this is going to be uh, minerals and water that the fungus is taking from the soil. So uh, fair exchange and various partners. Now, because this fungus grows into the soil, it can easily come across the roots of other plants and it can engage in a symbiosis, a mutualistic symbiosis with them as well. No problem there. Okay, this is this is completely natural. This is what is going on in most of our um, ecosystems. However, there is a bit of a risk here. Okay, so given enough time, you could have some of these plants have accidents. Uh, and for instance, this plant here could lose the ability to make uh, photosynthesis uh, um, components like chlorophyll. So if that happens, it might still be able to survive because it can get sugars, fats from this fungus here. Okay. So now this fungus is only providing to this plant. So not just minerals and water, but also carbon. And the fungus is uh, in turn getting those uh, uh, carbon molecules from that green plant. Okay, so now there's going to be a flow in this direction into this cheater plant. There are very many of these plants, it turns out, um, and they're quite interesting uh, because we have this sort of a nested arrangement that we end up with. So this plant can only occur where this fungus occurs, and this fungus can only occur where this plant is also present. Okay. Um, and we got quite a bit of uh, attention for this uh, kind of work from uh, other scientists, so that was uh, quite quite nice to see. Now, if we um, look at uh, a bit more closely at some of these cheater plants, uh, they might look like this, and I think they are simply extraordinary. So this is a plant that is completely inside of a fungus. Okay, uh, this arrow here shows you a, a seed. So these have very, very small seeds. They're called dust seeds, uh, and they require fungus to come along and start growing over them and give them food so that they can start developing. And this happens underground. There is no light available. Okay? 
Um, so they eventually uh, grow uh, quite a bit. And when they are big enough and they have enough resources, they will crack. Um, they will have a little crack on the surface and then a flower will start to come out. So up to that point, this plant, completely covered by fungus, had no roots, um, it had no shoot, it had no leaves. But it does have to make some seeds to have uh, a next generation. So this is a plant that is quite common in uh, various parts of North America. It grows in very dark forests uh, and it's called the Indian pipe. Um, and it looks like this. And uh, they are very dependent on a group of fungi that includes uh, the copper brittle gill, uh, which are rather elegant looking uh, mushrooms like this. In uh, Britain, we also have uh, some of these plants. Um, and the species that we have is called the Dutchman's pipe. And it looks like this. Um, and they're about a half a meter in, in height. And these plants are entirely dependent on this uh, fungi, Tracholoma, or the nights. And these fungi, in turn, are very dependent on uh, Scott's pine. Okay, so here there's some mutualism. Here there is some cheating going on. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, the Dutchman's pipe has become um, has declined quite precipitously in the UK, and in 2005 it became uh, red listed. And what this suggests is that uh, we see that there's a problem uh, with this plant, but because this plant is so dependent on its interactions, uh, perhaps actually the problem is in the fungi um, or in the interaction between the fungi and the trees. Um, and, uh, and then this, this leads to this complex system uh, not longer being able to support these cheats. And you could even think as a sort of a, a canary in the coal mine. This is sending us a signal that there is some problem in the systems. Okay. So let's um, try to look at this in, uh, in a bit more detail, um, in a slightly different way. And we'll come back at the end to these uh, rather uh, interesting plants. So, as you probably all know, we are all doing the biggest experiment. Um, it turns out that this is a, a very unscientific experiment. Uh, it is, there is no replication and there are no controls. And the experiment works like this. So, um, historically, in the air, there would have been about 200 to 300 ppm of um, carbon dioxide, so it's part per million. And uh, currently, uh, through our experiment, we brought them up to about 410. And this goes on uh, on increasing, even uh, despite uh, some slowdown in our activities due to COVID. And uh, what we do uh, daily is that we uh, burn fossil fuels and that adds uh, CO2 to the biosphere. Okay, So we are adding more and more carbon. And we've been doing this since about uh, the Industrial Revolution, and it has accelerated uh, greatly. We are also adding more and more and more nitrogen. Again, this starts uh, in the, at around the time of the Industrial Revolution and uh, goes on. And in here, we are taking nitrogen from the air that is not typically available to organisms, and we are uh, uh, fixing it and we are making it available in the biosphere. And this is mainly through fertilizers, um, but there are other sources. In fertilizers alone, we add about 170 million tons per year of uh, fertilizer to our crops. Um, we also add some nitrogen from the burning of uh, fossil fuels. Okay, And this has uh, also uh, been very effective. So historically, there have been almost no nitrogen entering these uh, systems, uh, ecosystems around the world. Uh, and currently, we've got about some places where it's still nearly zero. In some places, we've brought it up to about 50 kilograms per hectare per year, uh, which is quite a lot. Um, Carbon is a gas, so it is uniformly distributed through the planet, um, but the nitrogen is mainly as ions, so it is uh, mainly carried in precipitation. So, um, so this is what we currently have. The experiment is ongoing. Now, this seems to be having perhaps some effects on uh, how uh, plants grow. So, one um, study that uh, came out in 2015 uh, showed through quite a lot of analysis of the leaves 
of trees across Europe, that their uh, nutrition seems to be deteriorating. And this is quite alarming and makes trees more vulnerable, more vulnerable to, uh, to damage. And um, as is typical, we, uh, it's easier for us to deal with what's going on above ground. It's much harder to figure out what's going on below ground uh, because it's not light. It's dark and soil is very complex. So we typically treat it as a sort of dark box. However, uh, trees, as I told you earlier, don't have roots. They have mycorrhizas and trees don't interact with soil directly, but only through fungi. So if there's some problem in the nutrition of trees, this probably has something to do with fungi. Okay. So let's um, think about this analogy here. So we've got um, uh, the above ground part of a, of a tree here, and we've got this power source. Okay. So this uh, does for a photosynthesis, it gets energy, and this gets energy from a battery. This is quite useless unless you have a really good uh, set of tools that allow you to interact with the environment. The same is true for this tree. It will not be able to cope with soil. Uh, it will not be able to function uh, unless it has a wide range of species that it associates with. And you can see that they're all looking different. They all have different capacities in how they interact with the very complex environment of soil. So what's going on with them? So in 2012, um, uh, a British uh, naturalist, Peter Marin, uh, wrote this book and he said uh, something that I think is interesting. He said, we have only a very imperfect idea of the distribution and status of fungi. Hence, it is difficult to assess which species are generally rare or declining and which are merely poorly recorded or simply do not fruit. Nothing new really here. Um, this is Leonardo in the 1500s saying we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Um, so again, soil is, is a dark box. We don't, you know, it's very difficult for us to understand what's going on in there. And my I, I idea, my, my dream uh, is to, to someday be able to do soil biomonitoring. OK, uh, and this involves trying to really understand what's going on in the soil uh, biologically. And you might think that this is a, a bit of a fantasy um, because what I'm asking for is uh, standardized sampling to get lots of uh, numerical data uh, from fungi, from uh, plots of, uh, of, of different uh, types of, of plants where there's uh, quite a lot of data that is gathered uh, on the chemistry, on the physiology, uh, on the environment that those organisms are growing in. Okay, so quite a lot to ask for. But some of these things are already available. Um, and uh, this includes uh, the lower part of my list here. So uh, these long term plots do exist. Uh, they are intensively monitored and there's lots of environmental data that comes from them. Uh, and this is thanks to a uh, United Nations treaty uh, to which the UK is part of. And uh, this has led to the setting up of this uh, wide uh, forest monitoring network. It is un under a lot of pressure uh, and uh, the, the efforts of this uh, network uh, have been decreasing uh, due to lack of funding in recent times, uh, but it's still uh, going on. What we are missing is this uh, fungal data. And that's where uh, we thought we might be able to make a contribution and then be able to link that with all of this data here. So let's try it. Um, so we went out uh, and we sampled throughout uh, the UK and uh, Europe to get as much information as we could about fungi in soil. And it worked. Um, it is doable. A lot of people said it wasn't, uh, but it is very doable. Um, and we ended up with about uh, nearly 140 of these plots that are a quarter hectare each. And uh, we were able to get data from quite a lot of different factors, uh, so nearly 40. So this includes things like uh, the nutrition of the trees, the environment, the climate, geography, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of soil that we went through and lots of roots that we looked at. Uh, and it was quite a remarkable uh, study and it ended up in the sort of top science journal. So we were very, very, very excited about this. And uh, we've had many workshops with uh, ecologists and conservationists um, about these um, systems to discuss what we could do and what we could not do. 
And uh, one of the things that we agreed that we really needed was um, to get these response curves. Okay, and this is understanding how when there is something that is changing in the environment, how organisms respond. And um, if you are a bit geeky and you like statistics, uh, then this kind of data, if you have lots of it, uh, it allows you to do this uh, kind of indicator analysis. And that leads you into things like critical loads and tipping points. And tipping points is something that people are starting to talk uh, quite widely about, even, even the general public. Uh, and this is where ecosystems undergo changes that are uh, difficult to revert from. So, uh, I'm not going to bore you with lots and lots of uh, uh, graphs, uh, but I do want to show you this one because I think it is quite cool. Uh, and it had really never been done with other organisms. Uh, it is something that we were able to do with fungi. And, um, and in here, you've got uh, increasing amounts of uh, nitrogen pollution. Okay? And this is mainly coming through the air and through, uh, through rain into soil. And, um, and here we have different groups of fungi. So in black, we have the fungi that are most negatively affected by pollution. And you can see that up to about five kilograms per hectare per year, they are increasing. So nitrogen is acting as a fertilizer. It's a good thing, okay? However, beyond that, we are entering uh, levels of nitrogen that this organism didn't evolve for. Okay, so up to five, those they're sort of pre-industrial levels, and you still have those in some parts of Europe. Um, however, beyond that, these are conditions that we created, and these organisms are trying to cope with them. And unfortunately, there are very many that do not cope, so they crash quite precipitously. There are some organisms that seem to be coping a little bit better. Um, in some of these fungi, they also uh, increase up to five. Then they start to kind of wobble, uh, and then eventually they start to decline as well to around, about around 15 or so. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, forests in Britain are all in the sort of decline zone. Uh, and so it's not surprising that a lot of our forests are uh, having some problems. Now, who copes and who doesn't? Um, so again, complicated graph, but the message is actually pretty simple. So on this side, uh, fungi that are not doing well, um, and on this side, fu fungi that are more or less coping, okay, uh, up to a point. And you might know some of these fungi already. Uh, sorry, I didn't put the common names in here, but you might know their, their scientific name. And uh, what you can see uh, is that when these fungi are on roots, they have very different looks. So the ones on this side, these are the ones that are losing out. Uh, these ones are the really hard working fungi. These are the ones that make lots of filaments into the soil and they do something that we want a forest to do, which is to pump lots of carbon into soil and hold it there. Okay. The ones that are um, doing a little bit better are these ones here. Uh, these ones are very smooth. They do not pump a lot of carbon into soil. They do not work very hard at mining. Okay, so quite a shift in these uh, fungal communities below ground. Now, remember our cheater plant, um, so which is not doing very well either. Um, so this is our uh, Dutchman's pipe, and the fungi that it needs are over here. So a type of fungus that is not coping well with these conditions that we are creating in the environment. Um, another thing that we um, uh, have been trying to do uh, to get off the ground, literally, is a, an underground atlas. And this would involve uh, having maps of distributions of fungi from below ground data, uh, who are their hosts, what are their characteristics, and what uh, controls the, their occurrence environmentally. Okay. Um, further, we might be able to then uh, start creating maps uh, and this is a very early version, uh, having uh, hotspots and ecoregions. And this is really dividing the ecosystem uh, out there based on what fungi are present, where. And um, the message that I want to leave you with is that biomonitoring of, of soil is feasible. Uh, this, uh, there is no reason to, to not understand what's going on in the dark box. It is a choice that we make. Um, and what is next, I put a dollar sign in there because that depends on getting money to do the research, um, is uh, being able to predict uh, change both below and above ground, um, trying to avert uh, uh, tipping points going on underground, and then uh, 
trying to recover our forests and our, our heathlands. So two types of ecosystems that are being severely affected uh, by this. I've, we've been doing work in heathlands too, uh, but I have not presented that today. And uh, ultimately, uh, trying to uh, decarbonize the air, or at least hold on to the carbon, the vast amounts of carbon that are uh, already in soil. And we've been working with an organization called the Carbon Community uh, on this, and we're starting a new project in the autumn. Um, I want to leave you uh, by thanking a lot of the people that did most of the work, uh, and these are uh, people that are look very happy and smiling in all these pictures. Um, so uh, Philippa worked on uh, forests, uh, so did Laura in uh, Sietze, and um, Laura is still collaborating on this uh, work, uh, and so is uh, Sietze. If they work on heathlands, uh, Will worked on um, early land plants and their fungi, and uh, so does Jill, who's also working in uh, heathlands. Long list of uh, people and, 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 and organizations that have helped with this uh, research. And uh, last but not least, um, you're welcome to ask me some questions after this uh, presentation. Uh, you can also send me an email and ask me questions uh, later on, and you can get, uh, I believe, all of my papers uh, for free on a research gate. So thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. So I'm just going to ask uh, Martin to unmute and um, please, if you have any questions, if you can put them into the chat. Uh, and we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. So um, please, um, yes, a any questions are no stupid questions at all. Is isn't that right, Martin? Yeah, of course, of course. So can you hear me all right? Hi, Nathan. Uh, yes, yes, you're, you're coming through right. fine in terms of sound. So, um, so I'm reading in the chat. Uh, there's there's questions coming up in there. I'll 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 do my best to try to deal with some of these. Um, so there's a question here um, from Sarah. It says, "So an increase in carbon and nitrogen is being beneficial to the plants." And yes, um, uh, you know, ad additional carbon dioxide in the air uh, makes photosynthesis essentially cheaper it's, it's sort of more efficient to to run uh and so you know plants can make more biomass uh more easily um and uh regarding uh nitrogen uh, also yeah nitrogen can act as a as a fertilizer for plants this is mainly ammonium and, and nitrate um and you know th there is you know, to a point, um, you know, one of the points that I was trying to make there is that we are we are taking the systems into levels that they've never really experienced. Uh, early in land plant evolution, CO2 levels or carbon dioxide levels would have been very, very high, uh, you know, up to, you know, over a thousand parts per million. Um, but then as plants started to, you know, become really big and dominant, they and, and soils started to develop things to, to them. Um, those levels were brought down. So plants have been exposed to high levels of carbon dioxide before. However, for, for nitrogen, that is, you know, unheard of. Uh, you know, we've, you know, anywhere, you know, around 10 or so kilograms per hectare per year, um, which is what most of, most of the UK has or, or higher. It, these are essentially non-biological, you know, conditions there are you know organisms you know would have to come up with ways of dealing with that uh and so far it seems that they're you know fungi in particular um with which are involved in, in taking up this these nutrients are not doing terribly well um so whether we'll give them enough time to to adapt or not that's that's another story um what else is in here um <laughs> this is Sarah Miller. Ignore my first question. Uh, I, I just try to answer it. That's all right. Um, and okay, from from Easy, it says, are there any theories for how the ancient plants came to evolve to adopt fungi inside of them? Do we know if the fungi within this? Do we know is the fungi within the cells or around them? Yeah. So um, the the thinking is that fungi would have been 
probably established on land already. Um, there would have been some microbial biomass, so there would have been some uh, bacteria and, and, and other uh, microorganisms that would have been growing uh, for some time and accumulating a, a thin layer of, not, not a soil, but, but a thin layer of, of biomass, maybe a, like a crust on top of some sort of wetter places, and there would have been some fungi growing in there. Um, so fungi would have been exposed to other organisms, and as first land plants start to come in uh, from, from, uh, from, from water uh, into drier uh, land, uh, they would have been uh, interacting closely, uh, and it is quite likely that there would have been some uh, um, entry into cells. Um, so yeah, both around cells and, and into cells. Uh, it would probably happen quite early. I think in the Rhiney chart, there are some examples uh, which are this very uh, superb, you know, un unrivaled, unequaled, uh, uh, high quality fossils of plants and fungi uh, from Scotland. Um, there's, there's really nothing quite like that around the world. Um, in those, there are some examples of um, fungal cells that seem to be attacking, uh, uh, degrading uh, plant cells. So there is, there's already some evidence of, 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 of entry there. So there would have been probably some neutral interactions, some more negative interactions, and some interactions that were going from neutral into positive. Um, I mean, the, the planet ended up green. So obviously, the, the, the good guys won. The, the, the mutualistic or, or commensal uh, neutral interactions one in the end, uh, you know, and they, and they do to this day. You know, if you look at the at the land from from space, it, it does look green. Uh, so so plants and fungi did win. Um, gosh, this is moving very fast. Uh, so, are the numbers of fruiting bodies a good indicator of soil health, or do you need to dig down to really tell? Um, it it depends, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I've heard foresters say that, you know, when, once you start getting um, fruit bodies of ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, showing up in a, in a woodland that you've planted, that that's a good sign, that it is, it is establishing well. Um, the problem is, is, is getting, you know, quantitative sort of data that you can do statistics on a large scale, and that's what we really need because the, the changes that we are imposing on ecosystems are very large change, uh, you know, very large scale changes, you know, they're, they're global changes. Um, so it, it does, it does, it is a bit difficult to do that um, with that kind of data. And, uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of these um, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, or probably most of them, don't make any fruit bodies above ground. Uh, there are very many of them that are um, either truffles or, or crusts that are typically ignored when people do surveys, uh, or some of them just simply don't. You know, they, they, they don't make uh, any kind of uh, large reproductive structure. They might make something uh, microscopic and in the soil. So it, it does help a lot to get robust, uh, comparable, high quality, large scale data uh, to, to go into the soil. Um, another advantage too is that you know we could we could get this data just about any time of the year. So you could go in the middle of the winter, middle of the summer. You don't really need to wait until there are mushrooms around uh, to be able to get that data. Uh, and it does it does work. It gives you comparable data. Um, so there's another one here from Charles Sinclair. Do organic fertilizers such as manure uh, benefit the fungi community? Are the local solutions to the graded fungal communities? Um, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Um, um, most of the work that I've been involved with has been in forests. So, so this, uh, th there's not a lot of organic fertilizer being applied in there. Um, in, in agricultural systems, uh, yeah, um, it, it would be beneficial also because they add, they add biomass as well. Um, so the, the problem with a lot of the, um, agricultural systems is that is the tillage. So the, the tillage, uh, you know, releases a lot of carbon into the air uh, and it breaks the networks of, of fungal filaments. So you get very low diversity typically of, of uh, mycorrhizal fungi in, in crops. 
Um, so, um, so yeah, I think uh, sort of no-till systems uh, are are worth uh, are worth thinking more about in this in those kinds of systems. Um, but again, I, I don't I don't work a lot in agriculture, um, or I haven't so far. And um, there's another one here um, from Fedora. It says, "I'm starting a small-scale tree nursery. How can I encourage young trees to have healthy mycorrhizas? How nitrogen depletion be reducing woodland?" Um, yeah, so um, I, I guess a lot of this has to do with the, the kinds of soils that you're starting with, um, and um, you know you, you might you you might want to hold off on applying uh, uh, fertilizer to those to those uh, to those trees or try to try to minimize that. Uh, it will depend very greatly on where geographically where you are, uh, and you might want to look at. There are good maps online of of nitrogen deposition in the UK, so you can see whether you're in a low uh, in a low pollution area or in a high pollution area. Uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to guess. It's not just about being near cities or being near roads. Uh, it has a lot to do with the, with the topology of the ground, with precipitation, with wind. Um, so you know there are, for instance, parts of Wales that are not very well populated, uh, but they do have quite a lot of uh, uh, nitrogen coming down into them. Um, I'm sorry if I skip some of this. I, I, it's a bit hard to keep track of the. the all moving here. Um, so this is here from Eduardo. You mentioned forests in Britain are ecosystems general in decline. Is this reversible? So um, uh, yes, uh, potentially, um, at least to a point. If if we manage to control uh, or or sort of reduce uh, nitrogen emissions, and that can be done. You know, the the highest levels of nitrogen pollution in the air. Uh, were in Holland, um, much higher than, than in the UK. And they have managed through, um, through management and through um, you know, regulations uh, to reduce them. Um, and they have uh, recovered some of the fungi in their forests. Uh, it is not a full recovery. You don't bring them back to before the sort of tipping points. Uh, but there is some evidence that you can actually bring the system uh, back uh, at least to a point. Uh, we are we are actually trying to do um, we are trying to get funding to do work on understanding how this uh, uh, how to bring systems back and you know how to make them you know potentially cross this uh, this uh, tipping points. There's another question here from Selena Chien. Uh, is fungal diversity across the globe distributed similarly with plant diversity? Ah, that's a, that's a good question. So there are scientific papers on that. Uh, and actually, uh, not quite. Um, so there's quite a lot of diversity uh, in fungi in um, sort of mid latitudes, so in, in temperate regions. Uh, it's, not, it's not just like in. Um, in the flowering plants, uh, and to, to be honest, even even with with plants, uh, it is difficult to generalize. You know, if you look at sort of early lineages of land plants, like this uh, liverworts, very diverse group, uh, but they are actually, you know, for instance, they're they're more di more diverse in the Scottish Highlands than in the Alps, uh, and that would be the reverse if you were looking at, at flowering plants. So yeah, it's a, that's a that's a very interesting question, um, like all the others, of course. Um, I'm I'm looking at the clock here, uh, and, and Nathan might want to jump in here. But we've uh, we've I've got another event after this one, so I want to uh, stop at some point uh, so that we don't uh, we don't cut into the the next event, which starts at two o'clock. We we, uh, we have five more minutes. Okay. Um, so so maybe I'll, one one or two more questions. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and you know, I I I I put my email up there, so you know, feel free to to send me some some of your questions. It's it's, it's no problem. I I I don't mind. Um, so there's another question here from Tabby Priest. It says, "Could you give me an idea how exactly plants and fungi exchange substances in mycorrhiza? Um, how do they know when to do it?" Ah, that's that's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research going into this. It's an incredibly active area of research, um, and there's some incredible surprises coming up on this. Uh, so for instance, uh, it turns out that, so, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, let's not generalize, there's, there's different, very different groups of fungi that are doing these mycorrhizas. Uh, so they all do things differently. Um, but for instance, in the endomycorrhizas, it's uh, been very recently discovered that these fungi are not able to make uh, their own fats, um, so they cannot make cell membranes, and so they have to get all of their uh, fats to make the, the, the you know, whole cells together from the plant. Um, in the past, it was thought that they were getting just some, some form of sugar, um, but it also turns out that they are uh, even getting other uh, very essential things. So the, the idea here is that a lot of these fungi, um, they would have started, they would have evolved from fungi that were uh, great at breaking down uh, plant biomass. So for instance, cellulose, they would be able to break it down. Most of the mycorrhizal fungi have lost that. Okay, so they cannot break down plant tissues. Uh, and that is probably something that they had to give up to be let into the sort of candy and fat shop uh, that they have to, you know, take what they are given essentially. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's a, a very um, fast developing area. What exactly is being exchanged between the plant and fungus and, and where that is happening. Um, in many cases that is sort of uh, within uh, cells. Um, so it is, you know, uh, be between the cytoplasm of, of the plant and the fungus. It's really, really uh, close up. And uh, maybe one more here. So I already did one from Sarah Miller, so maybe somebody else. So uh, Zin Lab, it says, I know soil samples are taken when applying for environmental stewardship schemes. Could we push for fungi analysis to be incorporated into the process? Yes. You should, um, yeah, definitely. It's it's worth uh, it's worth inquiring. Um, I think uh, it, you know we, we do need to start getting uh, fungi into into how we understand soil because they are really major drivers uh, in 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 all ecosystems. Uh, it's it's not just about uh, chemical compounds. It's it's about what fungi are present where. Um, so yeah, we we do need to get to that. So maybe I will. Uh, finish up there Nathan is that is that okay that that's wonderful I think it's been Lovely. an absolutely fantastic presentation and a fantastic fantastic Q&A so I think um on behalf of no, I think we could all give a massive thank you to uh Martin for doing such a wonderful wonderful presentation and a big thank you to all for attending um, and thanks to Nathan for for running the show thank you so much all right. bye everybody thank you